boom. It's a weird sciencey fact that boggles my mind. When your big long tube gets there fast, it isn't nearly as bad as some people make it out to be. But sadly, it's been over two decades since getting there quicker was a priority for anyone. And since then, the airlines have been edging us into having to ride longer and longer and longer. Back in the good old days from the 1940s to the 1970s, we lived in a golden age of aviation. We transitioned from the peak of piston power to jet propulsion. And just like Ricky Bobby, the motto of the entire aerospace industry was, I want to go fast. And fast we went. Chuck Yeager first broke the sound barrier in 1947. The SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest jet-powered aircraft to ever fly, first took to the skies in 1964. A jet so fast they used it to mock Russia by not putting a single gun or defensive capability on it and then flying it through the heart of Russian airspace and just mocked any missiles or interceptors they sent after it with raw speed. A few years later in 1969, the Concorde, the plane that would bring supersonic speed to the consumer, first took to the sky as well. A plane that until 2003 would ferry passengers from New York to London in under three hours. And not one time did anybody complain about that not lasting long enough. Just imagine the excitement of living in a time where it seemed like we were just a few years away from being able to go anywhere in the world in just a matter of hours. However, as satellites took to the skies, the need for high-speed reconnaissance aircraft faded away. And as the Cold War ended and the space race wound down, NASA's budget found itself on the chopping block. Supersonic R&D started to dry up with it. But why didn't the private sector push forward on going fast? Well, unfortunately, supersonic flight has the super big problem of a sonic boom. See, sound is made by air being compressed and then released like a slinky traveling out like a wave. It is just a pressure wave of air. And as any object moves through the air, that air is compressed and released, making noise. But if you're traveling under the speed of sound, those waves can move out of the way of that moving object just as quickly as they're created, meaning that it doesn't make a lot of sound. But when an object starts traveling faster than the speed of sound, it's creating waves faster than the other waves can get out of the way. And those waves start bouncing into each other and compounding until they make a big boom. You can actually see it in this Schlieren photo here. This is a real photo. I'm not getting into how they actually take these photos, but it's real and you can see the shock waves bouncing in and converging at the tail end of these aircraft. Anyway, these booms are loud enough to literally shatter windows. And since most airports are located in or around major metropolitan areas, you can see where there might be a problem. It became such a problem that in like the 1960s, the Air Force had to pay out something like 40,000 claims for damage caused by sonic booms from testing and flying their aircraft. And then the FAA was like, yep, nope, no more. You can only do supersonic flight over the ocean. And that's why the Concorde got relegated to transatlantic flight. Then over time, the Concorde became increasingly more expensive to operate. One of them ended up crashing at one point and that gave it some bad press. And with no one building a fast flyer to replace it in 2003, just four years after the SR-71 retired, the Concorde took its last flight as well. And now sadly, these pinnacles of aviation reside as static displays in museums alongside all of our hopes and dreams of a futuristic future that wasn't crushed by a capitalist hellscape. Because following the Concorde's retirement, airlines quickly stopped caring about consumer experience and focused solely on maximizing profits. Sadly, that meant cramming our knees into our chest so they could fit more seats on fewer planes and then making us sit in those uncomfortably cramped positions longer as they slowed those fuckers down to save on fuel. So supersonic flight for the masses, like your hopes and dreams, is dead, right? Because even if we could convince corporations to give a shit about a consumer enough to operate supersonic commercial airliners again, we still have that pesky problem you get when Kevin James makes a mixed martial arts movie. And that boom is just physics that can't be fixed, right? Not so fast, because NASA thinks differently. Scheduled for its first flight next year, the experimental X-59 seeks to turn that sonic boom into a sonic thud only about as loud as your ex when she was mad at you getting out of the car. So what is the crazy complex science and technology that's gone into beating the boom? Uh, it's, it's, it's shapes. Just, just it's shapes. We're going back to like kindergarten geometry here. That's it. We could have been doing this the whole fucking time. We didn't need to wait for space age materials or special new technology. It, it, it's, it's just, just fucking shapes. They have known how goddamn sonic booms work for a generation and all we needed to do to beat the boom was just literally go back to the drawing board and draw a different shape. That's it. And like, I get it. You're building a fucking airplane flying in the most extreme conditions in the world and it's not like that simple, but it's still that simple. They built the SR-71 with fucking slide rulers in the 60s. Think they could have handled this, and then we might still have supersonic commercial flight, but no. Anyway, the science behind it is simple. The sound waves are compounded every time they bounce off of structural variations in the aircraft's fuselage. The protruding cockpit, engine intake cowls, a tail. Every time the air hits those and sharply bounces off, you get that compounded sound wave that turns into the boom. So they did away with those. They made the underside of the aircraft completely smooth, stuck a single engine up on top, and made the cockpit flush with the fuselage. Because where we're going, we don't need windshields. And then they made the thing a hundred fucking feet long, so the 
shockwave from the nose is spread way out from the shockwave from the wings, which is spread out from the shockwave of the tail. All of that should turn a big boom into a moderate thud. And if that works, then that removes the biggest obstacle for commercial aircraft companies to start building supersonic planes once again. And maybe with that, our dreams of supersonic commercial flight can live to be disappointed once again. But the fact that we can look forward to a future of fast flights from Fresno to France without the frustration of fracturing window frames, well, that is pretty mind-boggling.